and took notice of Aditya as he led Mithil Steel's almost unbelievable and controversial bid for Arcelor, at the time the world's second largest steel company. An acquisition fraught with political and regulatory uncertainties, but that didn't deter Aditya from convincing his father and the world that buying out Arcelor made sense. After a five-month-long battle involving multiple governments, hundreds of lawyers, a battalion of investment bankers, white knights, poison pills and a $33 billion offer, Aditya finally got what he wanted. Today, the world's largest steel company, ArcelorMittal, has revenues of over $100 billion and more than 3,20,000 employees. Well, cold steel is out, and I was reading that, and you know, it's unbelievable that this is really a story about steel, code names, and telephones being bugged, helicopter chases. It, it, it's a thriller. Was it? Was it really like that? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was a thriller every single day. Uh, we didn't realize when we launched, obviously, that it was going to be a thriller, and that when I joined the steel business ten years ago, that you didn't steel think it was going to be so like exciting. that. But uh, the ArcelorMittal deal was um, one of a kind. Uh, I don't think we'll see something like that again in the future. Yeah. Uh, clearly, the book does portray some aspects of the deal. It doesn't get everything right because it's supposed to be a thriller. But for the all of us working, slight exaggeration it, and a lot of exaggeration. I don't think it's a, it's an exaggeration as yeah. much, but just focusing on different aspects mm. of the deal. Mm. I think there was a lot of intricacy in the deal, uh, a lot to do with how we achieved the deal with the shareholders, what mm. we did with the politicians. It it covers the media angle very good. Uh, very well, I PR should say. PR battle. The PR battle. The clandestine meetings. <laughs> the clandestine meetings. Uh, some of the personalities, I think, are exaggerated, uh, especially because a lot of the colleagues work with us now yeah. at Arcelor yeah. Mittal. But uh, it's, it's one of those deals that you can never forget, a uh, mm -hmm. highlight of anyone working in Arcelor Mittal. We enjoyed it, uh, not only because we were successful, uh, but we think we changed the steel industry uh, through this transaction. A lot of people who worked on that deal say conceptually it was Aditya Mittal's deal. Uh, how do you respond to that? And you know, what was the hardest part of that battle for you personally? The hardest part was to make sure we win. Uh, because when you launch something like that, you cannot fail. Because then the company is not the same, the industry is not the mm -hmm. same, and the amount of risks that you have taken has all gone wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, my job is to be the head of m and right? So I've been doing this for the last seven years. So Arcelor was obvious uh, to me. Uh, it clearly was the best fit. Mm -hmm. Uh, not only would it change our company, but, but also the industry. Um, it's it's um, maybe an exaggeration, but if you think about us in the steel industry, we started with maybe one chip, if you use the example of a casino, right? We walk in with one chip, uh, and slowly, slowly, through our efforts, we build a steel company. And in 2001, when we started, we were small. We doubled that year in the worst downturn of the steel industry. Did it become an ego purchase somewhere down the line when the battle really begun to get bitter and ugly? Uh, I'd like to say no, but the answer <laughs> is yes, obviously. <laughs> I think not only for us, but for the whole company. Mm. It was a matter of uh, the whole of the ex mittal steel. I mean, are we going to be uh, uh, successful in, in, in realizing our vision of transforming the steel industry? Mm. It was all about that. It was no longer about the company. It was about the steel industry. Because if this deal had not gone through, I don't think the steel industry would be like where it is today. Consolidation uh, would not happen. People would be very careful in doing deals. Even Indian global companies would be careful because suddenly there was an example of a big company being rebuffed, right? Mm. So I think the world would be a different place. Uh, clearly, the steel industry would be a different place. So a Tata chorus may not have happened. May not have, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, Chorus was very clear once we had uh, uh, succeeded that they needed to do something about their future. And, and, and they began discussions with Tata very, uh, very wisely. Uh, you saw a week after, it was very interesting. Uh, why you realize the deal made a difference is when you announced the deal, no one did anything. The, the day we became successful, there were 10 steel companies in the world which immediately instituted defense mechanisms. Mm. Okay, only the day we were successful, that, which was in June, July. Not in January, mm. because they thought this is not going to happen. So it just shows how, how the world changed. Integration issues with Arcelor, everything been resolved, sorted out, all the differences buried, and the sort of targets that you'd set yourself for 2008 in terms of savings and revenues on target to meet those? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's happened much better than uh, any of us expected, I think, on both sides of, uh, of the deal, ex Arcelor, ex Mittal. Uh, uh, we expected synergies in three years, we achieved it in, in 18 months. 
Uh, the cultural integration has been phenomenal. Uh, people are genuinely happy. Uh, if you walk around uh, the company, there's a level of motivation and excitement, which I think is higher than it was even at the ex uh company. Uh, we've all made changes. Uh, we have learned a lot uh, from the Arcelor side and, and vice versa. Uh, to give you a cultural anecdote, uh, we used to never serve alcohol in our offices. Right? That was our old uh, style. But now we have uh, so many French uh, employees or so colleagues working wine. with us. So there's <laughs> wine, which is just an example of how we are making uh, people feel comfortable mm -hmm. uh, in the new entity. And, and people are not only comfortable, I think they're extremely motivated, passionate, and, and hopefully they're bold every day uh, of their working life. Well, one of the other differences that people talk about that you've made personally is in terms of corporate governance, and this was a huge issue that was brought up when the battle for Asalamithal was on. And, and you started by saying that a condition of yours was that you would work only for a public company, not for a privately held company. In terms of corporate governance, uh, what are the changes that you've actually gone about making to change the perception and the image? Well, there's a lot of things that you do. Uh, some are obvious, some are not. Uh, in, in terms of the most obvious uh, one is, is working for a public company. The second was um, convincing everyone that it was, that it was okay uh, to have a shareholding in ArcelorMittal, which was less than 51%. Your dad wasn't happy with that, was he? Uh, it took, it, obviously, it, 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 it's not, I wouldn't say he was unhappy with it. He's very happy with it. Uh, but uh, it, it just requires an understanding of what that means mm -hmm. and an appreciation. And today, if you ask him, he'll tell you that it doesn't matter what shareholding you have in a company, only performance matters. Mm -hmm. uh, so clearly, that's a learning experience. You've gotten him to change that mindset, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been a good discussion. Uh, I think it's been a good discussion. Uh, and, and fundamentally, uh, that, that's a move forward uh, because it reflects that the company or the family is not uh, onto the crutches of its shareholding but is in this company because of its performance capability. And I think that's very important. And that distinction, I think, is really the change in corporate governance. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't like it when I'm at a conference and people say, uh, this is a conference of family-run companies. I refuse and to attend And that's what that. happened when, when, when the, the deal for Oslo was going through. Uh, there was a lot of this, you know, the son of the owner and the family and so on and so forth. Did that hurt you then? It, obviously, it hurts you when, <laughs> when someone tells you something like that. Uh, and, and often you realize that when you're working in a company, you have been able to demonstrate yourself because of what you have achieved, but sometimes that does not translate so well in the outside world. Mm -hmm. uh, and that clearly then was, was uh, another uh, discussion with, with uh, stakeholders as well as with the media, and, uh, and, and that's part of life, I guess. I, I read somewhere that you said people are constantly trying to test you. How would, how would somebody test you, for instance? Give us, give us an example. Give us a sense of, of what you mean by that. I think I was tested when I joined the mm. company. I, I don't think people test me today. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, I probably failed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, how do they test you? Uh, well, I, t I talked to you about this uh, IPO. So I was part of the team working on this initial public offering. And there was a point in time when this deal was basically dead. And uh, uh, we, were, we were presenting to the top management about this deal. And my boss suddenly said, this is the deal's responsibility. So that's a test because uh, I've been given, I was never really responsible in the beginning for this transaction. I was 21 then. Uh, but I was made responsible when the deal was, was completely at its worst. Uh, and so then the whole organization is testing you whether you can bring it back up, you can revive it, and whether you can make it a success. I was fortunate. It was clearly a success and we did well. But that's, that's an example of how uh, the organization can maneuver to test you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's part and parcel. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't blame anyone. I think in, in a way it's good because it, it makes you stronger, it makes you more capable, uh, it makes you more confident. And so I, I went through some of that uh, in the early stages and, and now I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm pleased about it, but I think it was, it was a good thing. One of the other interesting things that I found, every article that has been written about you or every sort of prelude to an interview that's been done with you is, you know, Aditya Mittal, the, the, bo the man with the Bollywood star looks and, and you know, the boyish yeah, well, charm and all of that. Well, you see, you've met me now. You know that's a complete lie. <laughs> complete does, lie. Does that embarrass you, you know, when you read stuff like that? I think it's completely irrelevant. And I don't even look at me myself every like single that. Article, I mean, every single article I've read I has said that about you. Boyish charm, Bollywood star looks. And, and so now you know how, how it's not true. <laughs> well, that
was a glimpse into the life of Aditya Mittal. Next week, we continue our special interview with him. So come back and watch Young Turks International. Till then, from all of us here, goodbye and thanks for watching. India is an area of opportunity for you. I believe it's your number one priority area at this point in time. The potential is huge. I mean, today India, as you know, consumes 40 kilograms of steel per person. China is at 200 to 300. The United States is at 400. So the amount of growth is, is tremendous. Is there a succession plan in place or is there even need for a succession plan really? A lot of people in the company who are equally successful and, and capable. Uh, I may not succeed. I, I think it's, it's almost a curse to be called the heir apparent or the natural successor.